Good afternoon. My name is Agena Quezon Rogers and I'm the Supervisory Park Ranger at Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site. And today I welcome you to our presentation, The Speeches of Maggie Lena Walker, a dramatic reading series. Maggie Walker was a powerful speaker who could move an audience to action through her words. Crowds would pack a lecture hall, a church, an auditorium just to hear her speak. Unfortunately, no voice recordings of Maggie Walker exist today, at least none that we know of. However, there are written transcripts of her speeches and over the years, talented voice actors have brought some of those words to life, such as Irma Askey and Marie Goodman Hunter, and most recently, Daphne Maxwell Reed. However, those speeches, those snippets that are in our films and on our YouTube pages are just a mere sampling of the power of Maggie Walker's words. So we hope today, through this unabridged presentation of Mazzy, Maggie Walker's speeches, that you will be able to hear and experience her words as they were meant to be experienced through the spoken word. Today's presentation is Benaya's Valor, an address for men only. It was first presented March 1st, 1906 in the St. Luke Hall, which was the headquarters for Mrs. Walker's organization, the Independent Order of St. Luke. This speech was first presented in 1906, a year after a, a Thomas Frederick Dixon Jr. had written a book called The Klansman. Thomas Dixon was a politician, a lawyer, a Baptist minister, a lecturer, a novelist, a filmmaker, and an American white supremacist. Mrs. Walker didn't hold to his ideas. And this speech is her response because she had a lot to say about it. 22 single spaced typed words, pages, to say about it. So I present to you Benaya's Valor, an address for men only. My dear friends, it is customary for speakers to make all sorts of apologies and offer all sorts of excuses when they begin their speeches, and then go ahead and make the best effort they can. But this afternoon, we have determined to let the talk come first and the excuses and apologies come last. A few weeks ago, when in New York, a white man, Tom Dixon by name, calling himself a minister, stood up one Sunday afternoon in the pulpit of a white Baptist church surrounded by several of the best known colored ministers in New York City and uttered the most grievous slander against every colored woman in this country that human lips have ever uttered before. This man calling himself a servant of God, standing in God's holy sanctuary on God's holy day said, you never hear of white men committing assault upon Negro women. Assault means resistance. No Negro woman knows what virtue is. If a colored man anywhere, on land, on water, or in the air, had to an assemblage of white men made any such statement concerning the white women of these United States, the white men would have arisen in their might and that colored man would have died with that awful slander warm upon his lips. My dear friends, are we less to you than the white women are to the white men? 
In the law of our state, it is written that the penalty of the lustful touch of a black man's hand upon a white woman is death. But we, the Negro women of the land, have sunken so low that the white preacher can stand up in God's temple on God's day and declare in tones that echo around the world that every Negro woman yields to a white man's lust and that every Negro man's wife, mother, daughter, and sister is a harlot. My friends, do the lives of all the Negro women merit this most infamous, inhuman, and unchristian statement? Think through what the Negro woman has come from the time she landed at Jamestown until Lee surrendered at Appomattox, the word home and the word family had no earthly meaning so far as the Negro woman was concerned. The white man's lust for the Negro woman knew no law, brooked no opposition. The Negro woman was simply human cattle whose value was measured by her ability to toil for the enriching of her master and her capacity to conceive and stock her master's farm with Negro children. The Negro woman, black, brown, or yellow, so unfortunate as to be good looking, was by reason of her good looks, the innocent cause of her own destruction. There was no one to say to the white man, thou shalt not. His unholy lust and incest was law. The poor Negro man, more helpless than a crawling infant, stood by and saw his mother debauched, his wife taken from his own bed, his daughter brutally raped, and his sister ravished by her own father. And this went on 250 years until more than half of the Negroes in the country are of mixed blood and a million mulattoes, so nearly white, have lost themselves in the white race to hide the crimes of their fathers. And now, after all this debauchery of centuries, with only 40 years in which our bodies have been our own, with the stench of slavery and the white man's immorality not yet out of our nostrils, we are told by a white man using the church that he may better serve the purposes of the devil, that we are all bad women. My friends, it turns my blood to molten fire. For it has been said, if white men were to place a church upon every hilltop and a school in every valley, they could not right the wrong which they have done to the Negro women of the South. But why linger on this sad picture of sin, misery, and shame? The Negro woman of today, despite the degradation and the mire through which she has come, is under God moving to the front. Out of the darkness, out of the night, has the black woman crawled to the dawn of the light beaten by lashes and bound by chains, a beast of burden with soul and brains. She has come through sorrow and pain and woe, and the cry of her heart is to know, to know. Out of the darkness, out of the night, has the black woman crawled to the dawn of the light. She has come through the valley of dark despair. She has borne what no white woman ever could bear. She has come through misery, grief, and woe. And the cry of her heart is to know, to know. Hasn't it yet crept into your minds that we are being more and more oppressed each day that we live? 
hasn't it yet come to you that we are being oppressed by the passage of laws which not only have for their object the degradation of Negro manhood and Negro womanhood, but also the destruction of all kinds of Negro enterprises? Every legislature in the South legislates against the Negro. And the effect of this same legislation is felt throughout the length and breadth of this country. Wherever the Negro sets his foot, let it be east, north, or west, he is being met by the same Jim Crow treatment which he receives in the South. Let us examine what is going on here right under our noses in Richmond City in the Capitol Square. The Jim Crow car, once confined alone to our steam cars and long distance travel, is now upon every steam and electric line in the state. Not alone our cars, but our steamboats and our ferry boats carry the same degrading Jim Crow signs. The Negro is paying to travel first class price for second and third class accommodation. Our last legislature struck at our insurance companies and now we have about five or six in the entire state. A bill is now before the legislature to establish a commissioner of banks and bankings, giving the commissioner the power to enter your bank, inspect your books, papers, notes, and bonds, and to declare whether you are properly conducting your own business. For whom do you suppose that this law is being primarily passed? A similar bill with similar powers for the creation of an insurance commission is also pending. For whom do you suppose this insurance commission is being primarily created? White people have been running banking and insurance for more than a thousand years. Don't you imagine that they ought to know something about the business by this time? Then whom are they after? They are after the Negro banks, which have come into existence in Richmond, Hampton, Norfolk, Newport News, and all over the Southland. The white man doesn't intend to wait until the Negro becomes a financial giant. He intends to attack him and fetter him now, while he is an infant in his swaddling clothes helpless in his cradle. Then we have another bill to divide the school fund and to give the Negro schools only the proportionate part which is taken from the taxes paid by the Negroes. Do you know what this means? It means a school term for the Negro boy and girl averaging about four weeks. And yet, with the loss of citizenship, Jim Crowed, shortening of our school term, the destroying of Negro business enterprises, the refusal of employment to Negroes, the attempt to drive out the Negro barbers, and the Negroes from every other occupation, with hostile legislation on the increase, there are those who still believe that we should look to the Lord and keep our mouths shut. If the ants were being treated as the Negro is in this country, I believe that they would get together for their own protection. The wisest man that ever lived said, to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Somebody must speak. Somebody must cry aloud. 
The afflictions and persecutions of our people must be told. We must get together and reason together. Somebody must cry out. Upon a day, the Savior rode into Jerusalem, and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even as the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with loud voices for the almighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the best people, some of the most refined and best educated, the teachers, priests, and lawyers were much disgusted at the noise and cries of the multitude as they sang Hosanna and praised the Lord. And they said to Jesus, Master, rebuke thy disciples, stop them, make them cease their noise and clamor. They should be quiet. But Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. As in the days of Jesus, so today, if our men forget to do their duty, if our women remain silent, God will cause the babes in the cradle to cry out. A thousand years before the coming of Christ, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was a man of renown, one of King David's mighty men of war. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction to righteousness. It is for this reason that I have taken as my subject Benaiah, a man who lived nearly 3,000 years ago. It is a fact well known to those who make examination of the men and women of Bible days that they were simply human beings, not angels. They were men and women who loved and hated, who were good and bad, who were faithful and treacherous, exactly as the men and women of Richmond are this Sunday afternoon, March 4th, 1906. In fact, my dear friends, God made this earth for human beings and then fashioned these beings out of the earth so that they are but earthly beings. And he who goes around hunting for seraphs, cherubims, and archangels will always be disappointed. I am not hunting for angels then. This is not the place. Therefore, I am talking to men about another man who lived nearly 30 centuries ago. A man who was so brave and valiant hearted that he was captain of King David's bodyguard, as well as one of the king's closest advisors. It matters not who we are, what we are, how rich we are, how intelligent, how good. No man lives alone. He must have advisors and friends. And don't you know that is why I'm talking to you this afternoon? I want your friendship. I want your love, your sympathy, your protection, and your advice. As Benaiah guarded David, protected him against the Philistines, gave him counsel and advice. So I am begging you, men of Richmond, to guard me, protect me, and advise with me. As Benaiah recorded as one of the mighty men of Israel, 
so I am asking you to record yourself as one of the strong race men of our city. As Benaiah did valiant deeds for Israel, so I am asking each man in this audience to go forth from this building determined to do valiant deeds for the Negro women of Richmond. My friends, come let us put our heads together and run over in our minds and see if we know of anything on earth in the whole human family quite so helpless as the Negro woman. Have you thought about the number of occupations by which she makes her living? She is a domestic in the white man's house and cooks, cleans, scrubs, washes, nurses, and waits. A few are seamstresses, a few teachers, a very few clerks, with the legislature doing all that it can to drive the few clerks out of the business. The census of 1900 makes this most remarkable showing that of the 303 gainful occupations in which the men of the United States are employed, there are 5 million women employed in 295 of them. There are no women employed as firemen, soldiers, sailors, roofers, slaters, steam boiler makers, nor as helpers in the three occupations last named. Just think, my friends, in all the occupations by which white men are rearing families, feeding and clothing them, white women are earning a livelihood side by side by the, with the white men in all save eight. Eight occupations. From being in the fire departments and from the army and navy, they are barred by law. And from the occupations last named by lack of physical strength or else the white woman would be found in each of them leaving to the white man no exclusive occupation. A few days ago, a visit to our state library in the Capitol Square disclosed this state of affairs. The library is in the charge of a white man, while a dozen or more white women flit about from place to place as their different duties call them. Even the messenger carrying the books from the library building to the Capitol is a white woman. And the only black face to be seen is a young Negro man in a convict suit, dusting and keeping things in order generally. You know too well the condition of affairs in every business house in the city. The white woman is there. You know as to the city offices, the state offices, and the United States offices. The white woman is there. You know as to the stores from which you bought your hats, shoes, and clothing. The white woman was there. You know how it is where your wife and children bought their hats and dry goods. The white woman was there. Sometimes when you are so thirsty and just drop in to get a cool glass of beer, the white woman is there to draw it for you. You stop in and pay your rent. The white woman is there to write the receipt. Step to the phone and by the time you touch it, a white woman is there. The white woman is everywhere. And my dear friends, she is in many of the places that she is because your money, your influence, your patronage keeps her there. While your own women, flesh of your flesh, blood of your blood, are left to shift for themselves as best they can to keep hats on their heads, shoes on their feet, and clothes on their bodies. Don't you 
know that more than half of our women who fall and go down into the mire of shame do so from necessity, food and clothes rather than from choice? Are we not so much to you as the white women are to the white men? Are we not as much to you as the white women you are so loyally supporting by the nickels, dimes, and dollars you are spending with them each week? Are we not as much to you as the white woman is to the white man? Are we not? But my friends, it is not enough to say yes with your lips. If you love these black women, your own women, your own wives, mothers, daughters, and sisters, I ask you the same question Christ asked Peter. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, knowest all. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And I believe that if Christ was here this afternoon, standing before us here upon this platform, asking of you whether you love the women of your race, I believe he would say to each of you, if you love these black women, feed them. When God gave Israel her first king in the person of Saul, he gave him because Israel wanted a leader, a general to lead her against the Philistines who were conquering, oppressing, and taxing her beyond endurance. But after Saul became king, he spent so much of his time in warfare against David instead of against the Philistines that when David came to the throne, Israel's prestige was very low and she was dominated by the Philistines. And today, just as it was with Israel 3,000 years ago, this is the greatest ob obstacles in the path of our race progress. Our churches make war upon each other instead of, of upon sin and Satan. Our societies and clubs fight each other instead of combining against the common enemy. Our insurance companies are hostile to each other instead of being hostile to the power which seeks to tax them to death. Our businessmen are so prejudiced against each other that they give their trade and patronage to the very white men who are trying to drive them out of business. And yet, in spite all this throat cutting and stabbing, our God permits us to succeed in a way. Of Benaiah is written as follows. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, slew him, with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among the three mighties. 
Benaiah was a man of great valor. Valor is great boldness in confronting the attacks of a personal enemy. Valor is great bravery in personal action. Of the valiant deeds of Benaiah, there is but one of which we shall speak. He went down and slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Three distinct acts marked this deed of Benaiah's. This is what he did. He went down in a pit. It was on a snowy day. He slew a lion. My friends, let me examine these three acts of Benaiah's and see if you are as valiant as he was. If you were coming up St. James Street in the broad open daytime, the street thronged with men, women, and children, and a man were to walk up to you and insult you, curse and abuse you, knock you down before you could even learn the cause of his attack. There is not a man in here who would not arise and run for safety or get busy fighting quickly and desperately. The abusive words ringing in your ears, the cowardly blow struck unexpectedly and before you could defend yourself struck in the broad open daytime in the public street, struck in the presence of nearly a hundred folks, and these folks saw you knocked down. This would make the greatest coward in the world fight and fight desperately. Fight because the women saw him knocked down and heard him cursed. Any kind of man under these circumstances would fight to the death or until somebody stopped him. There has been many a fight simply because the insult was seen and heard by others. There is many a man sleeping the quiet sleep of death because he attacked a man in the presence of a woman. Things said to us and done to us become a hundredfold more offensive when seen and heard by others. But Benaiah went down in the darkness of a pit. No one saw him. No one stood by to encourage him. Alone in the darkness and gloom of a pit, cut off from retreat, where he couldn't even run had he so desired, where defeat meant death. There the valiant Benaiah pitched his battle, fought, and one. Men frequently invite each other around the corner or around in the alley, but you have never seen a man invite another to go down into a pit to fight. When you go down into a pit to fight, you have made up your mind not alone to fight, but to kill. And when a man makes up his mind to kill another, he doesn't want the crowd. He wants to be alone. Darkness then becomes sunlight and a narrow pit as big as an open field. Again, when Benaiah thought it was a cold, snowy day, in the cold, dreary, snowy weather, the skies leaden and overcast, the roads and byways deserted, there must have been something more than the average insult to cause a man to fight. The words and the blows that would cause an immediate outbreak and a most terrific struggle in July are permitted to pass in January with the significant warning. Go on, I'll catch you and make you out the next time I see you. But Benaiah cared not for the trifling inconvenience of snowy weather meant nothing to him. And while the weather stormed and the snow rendered his foothold all the more unsafe and insecure, while he knew that one false step meant death, Benaiah went into his battle 
in the narrowness and darkness of a pit with snow pelting him and the keen wind hitting him. Would you have gone down into that pit on a snowy day to fight the lion? Would you go down into a pit and fight a lion on a snowy day if by so doing you could relieve the oppression of your people? When Benaiah went down into that pit on a snowy day, he went down to fight a lion. He knew there could be no talking the matter over down in that pit. He knew that there could be no explaining as two men could have done, no discussing, no retreating. He knew that hungry, freezing lion couldn't talk. He knew that famished lion hidden away in that dark pit with eyeballs glaring, with jaw distended, with tail lashing the sides of the giant body crouched on the bottom of that pit would be on him like a flash. He knew that he was going to fight a lion, not a bear, not a leopard, not even a tiger. He was going to do battle with the masterpiece of God's lower creation, the mighty lion whose roar caused the cedars of Lebanon to awaken. He knew that a blow from the lion's paw meant death. He knew that one of them would surely die, perhaps both. But none of this stopped him. He was fighting for Israel, the men, women, and children of his race. He went down into the pit on a snowy day and slew the lion. A few minutes ago, I said to you that we wanted our men to stand by us as Benaiah stood by Israel. This lion forced by cold and hunger from his mountain haunts, had doubtless come to one of the villages of Israel hunting for food and had hid himself away in a pit to the terror of the men, women, and children of the surrounding country. But Benaiah went down into the pit and slew him and freed his people from danger and death at the hands of the lurking lion. To do this, he put his own life at stake and fought with the bloody weapons of war. As much as I want you to be as valiant as was Benaiah of old, I am not asking you to risk your life, nor to menace the life of any living creature. Benaiah, the captain of King David's guard, fought the battles of Israel. He fought the lion that was terrorizing Israel. My friends, there is a lion terrorizing us, preying upon us, and upon every business effort which we put forth. The name of this insatiable lion is prejudice. Prejudice is the most unreasonable, the most inhuman, the most unchristian animal that stalks upon the face of God's green earth. The lion of prejudice is ever ready to strike down the Negro. The white press, the white pulpit, the white business associations, the legislature all show their prejudice against the Negro and they are ever ready to strike him down just as the lion which Benaiah slew was ready to strike down the helpless Israelite that fell into his clutches. Let me cite an instant of legislative prejudice that seemed almost inhuman. I am reading to you a clipping from the news leader of last Thursday. The House of Delegates yesterday afternoon passed the Houston bill, establishing the Virginia State School for Colored, Deaf, and Blind Children.
the only voice of opposition was raised by Delegate Guafni of King William, who contended that the affliction of these children was principally due to the vices of the parents and therefore deserved no commiseration. Just think of the heart of the man who can stand upon the floor of the legislature and make such an utterance about the poor, afflicted, unfortunate colored children, tongueless, earless, and sitting in everlasting darkness. But unlike Benaiah's lion, the lion which we meet every day does not skulk in the darkness of a pit, doesn't hide away until the coming of the night than to sally forth seeking whom he can devour. The lion which whom we contend daily is in Broad Street, Main Street, and in every business street of Richmond. Even now, at this moment, while I am standing here talking to you, that lion is seeking some new plan of attack. The white man's prejudice never sleeps or slumbers. It is swift of foot, outstrips the wind, is never satisfied, and seeks to crush when it finds that every dollar which the Negro makes does not come into his store and his bank. Listen to me, men of Richmond, listen to me. Some of you are my closest personal friends. Some of you have stood by us in everything which we have tried to do. Some of you have put your money in our hands, in our bank, and in our store. Some of you are our regular customers, you, your wives, and your children. And there are some, I am sorry to say, sitting here looking at me, who have never had their feet across the door sill of our bank or our store. Now, I am not going to find fault. There is so much good to be said for those who have stood by us and given us their support that I have not one single unkind word to say against those who by their acts have declared that it is a matter of indifference to them whether the lion destroys us or not. There are so many thanks to be given to Reverend Dr. Payton, his deacons and his members for their loyal and continuing support that we have nothing to say not even an unkind thought about the churches which have forgotten us. There is so much gratitude in our hearts for Reverend Dr. Payton, who stood up in his pulpit on a snowy day and helped us slay the great lion which would devour us, that we have not time to feel unkind to those preachers who tell us they love us but are too busy saving our souls to give much attention to our bodies. There is so much due to the deacons of the Sixth Mount Zion Baptist Church for their public help and assistance for this magnificent alliance that we thank God for the friends which he has given us rather than complain about those which we have not. Friends, there is too much for which to be joyful at this time to even think of our sorrows. Now listen, while I tell you of incidents which will show you which way the lion of prejudice is traveling and the tricks he is playing. These are private matters, but I want you to know and there is no way on earth that you can know unless you are told. I believe when you know, you will think. I believe when you think, you will act. I believe you will become a Benaiah and help us fight the lion of prejudice. It took us two years of dealing undercover to obtain the property in which the St. Luke Bank 
and the St. Luke Emporium are located now. When it was found out for what purpose the property had been bought, there was an attempt to, made to buy the premises from us at an advance of several thousand dollars more than the purchase price. In addition to this, there was a personal offer of $10,000 in cash if we would not start the Emporium. But nothing changed us. The bank is there, the store is there, and Negro women and men are there earning a living and getting a business education. Women of your race, your own flesh and blood, as polite and capable as any other women on Broad Street. But they are Negro women, and therefore, some of you pass them by and go above or below or across the street, preferring to feed the lion of prejudice rather than your own women. But when the lion of prejudice found out that we could not be eaten up by his money, another form of attack was made. Those of you who read the papers have doubtless noticed with what activity there has been formed a white retail dealers association, taking in every white man or woman selling anything at retail, the whiskey dealer, baker, butcher, druggist, milliner, coal dealer, shoe dealer, in short, every white merchant, regardless of what kind of retail business he conducts, has gone into the association. Now, for what purpose have they done this? Simply to crush out those Negro merchants who are objectionable to them because they compete with them and get a few dollars which would otherwise go to the white merchant. When the White Retailer Dealers Association decides to crush out a Negro merchant, the wholesale merchants are notified not to sell to the Negro, John Smith, giving some trivial excuse for the same, saying if they do, they will not receive the patronage of the white merchants comprising the White Retail Dealers Association. A few days ago, as has been our custom, we placed an order with a Richmond wholesale house for several thousand dollars worth of dry goods. After holding the order for several days, we were asked to pay cash. Now, if the same order had been given by any reputable white firm, the goods would have been delivered and from 60 to 70 days allowed, as well as a discount before the day of payment. In short, a white merchant can get his goods, place them upon his shelves, and sell them, collect from his customers, and pay his bills, while Negro merchants must pay cash for what they buy. This is what the Lion of Prejudice is doing on Broad Street. And every time you set foot in a white man's store, you are making the line of prejudice stronger and stronger and making it all the more easily for him to devour the Negro merchant who is trying to do business. Another instance. A few months ago, we were in New York entering a wholesale house. We were shown a letter saying, that the St. Luke Emporium was underselling the white merchants of Richmond, and if our trade was carried by that house, that these Richmond merchants, whose names were signed, would immediately withdraw their patronage. Now just think, there were some of our folks here, walking around on the outside, who had never set foot on the inside, saying, oh, they sell everything so dear, they are too high for me. While the white merchants were filing complaints in 
writing in New York that we were selling too cheap. Now, what do you think of that? A few days ago, there was an auction sale of the house adjoining the savings bank. For some little time, a most persistent attempt has been made to make us either sell ours or buy the adjoining property at a fancy figure. So on the day before the sale, we were notified that it was going to be purchased for a bar room. Imagine our feelings. We have one bar room on, uh, beside us on the western side, and to hem us in with another on the eastern side would simply be awful. But this did not make us buy. And finally, one of the agents said, if these niggers are left here, they will not stop until they own the corner of 2nd and Broad Street. And upon being asked if he did not think it was right that the Negroes should patronize the store, which was giving Negro women a chance to earn an honest living, he said, yes, it is right, but we are going to make them pay the price. Too. And if we had the patronage of the 50,000 Negroes in and around Richmond, or if we had the patronage of the, and influence of the men sitting here in this room, we would be willing to pay the price. And now, my friends, let us lay aside formality and let me appeal to you as sober, reasonable men. The St. Luke Emporium has been very largely the work of our women. If we have united and struggled and have gotten to the point which we have, deep down in your hearts, don't you feel that you ought to spend your money with us? We have the same kinds of shirts, cuffs and collars, underwear, shoes, and other things worn by men as the white stores have. We are not one cent higher, and in many instances, cheaper in our prices than the other stores. Why then do you pass us by and carry your money and your friend's money to the men who would not give your child employment except as a porter? If white men are forming combinations and associations for the purpose of crushing us out, is there one singled colored man in here that will now deliberately go and carry his dollars to the white merchants so that he can fight us? Are you really going to feed the lion of prejudice and make him stronger and stronger so that he can all the more easily devour us? So fearful is the white man, lest he give the colored man some advantage over some white man or white child, that the little colored newsboys selling papers upon our streets cannot get their papers until all of the white boys have been served first. Do you ever think of this when you are buying a paper from a white boy and can't wait to give the poor little Negro boy your penny? Aren't we the most peculiar people on earth? My friends, what would it mean if our preachers in these great churches and our teachers in these great schools and our businessmen in our various business concerns would actually join their patronage and influence with that of the laboring man and woman. Sometimes we see with our own eyes the men we are feeding and clothing, not alone themselves, but feeding, clothing, and housing their wives and children. Sometimes we stand in our door and look across the street and see our money, 
the black man's and the black woman's money go into the white man's dry goods store or carried past our door by the treasurers of our clubs, our schools, and our churches down to the white man's bank. Sometimes we have employed colored mechanics to work for us and have paid them thousands of dollars. And yet when it comes time to shoe themselves and their wives and children, we have seen them take the money drawn from us and carry the same just below us and spend the money with the white merchant. These things ask and make us ask our God, why do the men we feed and clothe think so little of us to give our money to those who are trying to crush us? Listen to me, my friends. The only way we can kill the lion of race prejudice is to stop feeding him. Stop feeding him every Saturday night and every Monday morning. There are 50,000 Negroes in and around Richmond. You will agree with me that they certainly average not less than $1 per week for food, clothes, and medicine. $50,000 per week means $200,000 per month and $2,400,000 per year, the lowest possible amount that we are spending. Our white papers, our white pulpits, and our legislature preach but one doctrine, and that is the doctrine of separation. If the white man insists that we must have separate cars, churches, schools, hotels, parks, and places of social meeting, then why not separate banks and stores? Why do we insist on pushing ourselves where we are not wanted? Or are we so simple and short-sighted that we are willing to give the white man every dollar that we can muster when he is daily telling us to get away from him? And now, gentlemen, I make the first part of my speech last. I apologize to you for the time which I have consumed. My heart is heavy and my eyes are filled with tears. I am only a woman. At best, a few short years my son will have set. But whenever the sunset of my life does come, it will be with the consciousness that I have striven and toiled night and day, not alone to build this pile of brick which towers up and around and above us, but with the thought ever pressing upon me to help provide some means of employment for our women and our children. How are they to grow up good men and women? How are they to be fed? And wherewith are they to be clothed? For the last time, from the depth of my soul, let me appeal to you to give us your patronage. Spend your money with us. Help us to help ourselves. You are strong. You are our benayas, our protection, and our refuge. While we can do much ourselves, we can do more with your aid. The Emporium and the Bank is to us as is the sprouting acorn. But to your boys and girls, it will be a tall, spreading giant oak, affording shelter and protection for a thousand. Will you come to us? Will you help?